The first person I'm going to bring up is a stand-up comedian. He's an actor. He's a card-carrying member of the Lambs and a good citizen in so many ways. He was very helpful in some key ways to Mark's Fest. So we're very grateful to him. And uh, he's wanted to come and share some of his Marx Brothers related memories and experiences. And we wanted to open uh, this event with him. Would you please welcome Bob Greenberg. That's me. How are you? Any Marx Brothers fans out there? Some of you are looking at me and thinking, what is Chris Christie doing here? But I'm not Chris Christie, and I'm not Dan Aykroyd either. I'm Bob Greenberg, and so welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to have a little fluid, a little agua. So let's talk about the Marx Brothers, huh? The first time I met a Marx Brother was flipping the channels as a kid in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Anybody from Brownsville, Brooklyn out here? No, okay, no Jews. Okay, fine. <laughs> and I caught Harpo from, I think it was uh, Stage Door Canteen, am I getting that title right? Uh, scaring a young lady, chasing her, and then eventually falling on a couch and going to sleep. And I wondered, who was this man? And then I would see him in cartoons. You know, you, they might have some hula dances, you know, in those Hawaiian grass skirts, and Harper would show up, you know, with a lawnmower to chase them, you know. And I wondered who it was, and I remember watching I Love Lucy. I found him fascinating. And at the end of the I Love Lucy show, if you remember uh, Desi Arnaz and William Frawley, they dress up as, uh, you know, Groucho and Chico. And I wondered who they were. My sister said they were the Marx Brothers. Never heard of them before. But then late night, Rex Reed. Does anybody remember Rex Reed used to show movies? He had a W.C. Fields Festival on WNEW Channel 5 at 11, 11.30 at night. And he had a Marx Brother Festival. And uh, I was in grammar school. I shouldn't have been watching, but <laughs> I was. And uh, I saw Horse Feathers was the first Marx Brother film I ever saw. And Groucho amazed me. You know, I was about eight or nine. And uh, I didn't quite get what he was saying. He was going so fast, and of course the puns were going over my head, but I was fascinated by him. Time passed, and I would watch him whenever he was on the uh, Dick Cabot show or whatever. And Minnie's Boys, does anybody know Minnie's Boys? Yes, uh, was going to premiere on Broadway. This is 1970. And for my birthday on March uh, 26, we were gonna go see Minnie's Boys. I would be 10. Minnie's Boys was supposed to open March 24th, but something happened. I don't know, Shelley Winters lost her underwear. I don't know, something happened, and it was delayed. So if you had tickets for the 24th, they would be honored on the 26th. And of course, if you had tickets on the 26th, you were out of luck, and you'd have to go to the box office and exchange them. So with heavy hearts, my father, my sister, and I uh, drove from Brooklyn, went to the Imperial Theater, to exchange our tickets, and I must have looked really sad. And my sister said, you know, it's his birthday, his 10th birthday, we were hoping to see the show, but we got away. And the, the box office lady, she was, she was a sweetheart. She looked around, she says, here's three tickets, first row mezzanine dress circle, and happy birthday. So, now the thing was, my father, I think it may have been a, a Passover week or something, he was home from work, he had, hadn't shaved, he was wearing his rain hat, it must have been raining. We were not dressed at all. Now this is a time when people used to wear tuxes, especially on opening night to the theater. And I was sitting next to a woman who had one of these white boas and you know a, a sparkling evening gown, and, and she kept looking at me like, like, like she was Margaret Dumont, you know? And we looked like the Beverly Hillbillies on opening night. So, but it didn't matter. We loved the show, and the, the guys playing the young Marx Brothers were amazing. But at the very end of the show, who walks on stage but Groucho Marx? And he says something to Louis J. Stadlin, which I once spoke to Louis J. Stadlin. I said, what did he say? He said, let's, let's take a walk, he said. And Groucho and Louis J. Stadlin did the Groucho walk up and down the stage. So I got to see Groucho on a Broadway stage do his famous walk. And what struck me first was Groucho was so small. He was much smaller than Stadlin than anybody else. When he got up, he made a curtain speech, and he said, uh, I wish uh, my brothers uh, uh, Chico and Harpo were here. And then it's the first time I ever heard Chico pronounced that way. And he says, well, you know, Chico, you know, he's probably somewhere playing cards. He said, <laughs> and he said, Harpo, well, Harpo with that harp of his, he's, well, we all know where he is, which was really sweet, you know, so. Time Passes in Animal Crackers, yeah, have you heard of that movie? <laughs> is re-premiered, 
It's going to be at the Sutton Theater. 50, anybody? Did anybody go to that? 57th Street? Yeah. Sutton Theater, yeah. And they advertised that Groucho would be there. So my friend and I, Fred Ivory, we lived in Brooklyn, two fair zone in those days. We schlep out to the Sutton early to get on the ticket buyer's line for the 8 o'clock show. Now, I don't know if you've seen this in some of the books, it was a madhouse. This ticket buyer's line for the 8 o'clock show went from almost like 3rd Avenue to 2nd Avenue. We were on it waiting to get tickets. And this thing was kind of a scam because I don't think they sold any tickets. They just had us on this line. Because as it got later and later, the police put up barricades and all this. And then eventually <laughs> they announced they were sold out, which made no sense. But Groucho showed up and all of us broke the line to get closer to Groucho. And the police came. And there is a picture somewhere. I think my friend with a billy club. I don't know why. He was only 16 years old. They put it up against him. What, what was he doing? He was yelling, Groucho, we love you or whatever. So we were kind of depressed about not getting into the show and seeing Groucho. We saw him a little bit. And uh, we decided that we would follow him <laughs> when he comes out. So he comes out, we can't get to him. We grab a cab, my friend's 16. I'm, I guess I'm 14, yeah, I guess I'm 14. And we <laughs> get into a cab and we say, follow that car. <laughs> now our cab driver wasn't like the ones in the movies. He, he lost the, the limo. But I remembered what hotel he was in, because it was in the paper. So we show up at the hotel, and there's two kids, autograph hounds, and, a, and an older gentleman who probably should have known better, also an autograph hound, <laughs> standing outside. And he says, did you see Groucho? I think Groucho's supposed to be here. And he says, yeah, I know Groucho's here, but we didn't see him. We go in, and we ask the concierge, a young guy. We say, uh, is Groucho here? Is Gra and the guy says, oh, yeah, he just went up to his room. It's 14B or something. <laughs> So we get in an elevator, we go up, my friend Fred knocks on the door, someone opens the door, and, we, and he says, um, hi, we're fans of Groucho, can we say hello? And the woman says, just a moment, she closes the door, and we're waiting, and in a short time, a German house stick shows up, like in the movies, could, be, could have been Herman Bing or something, you know? And he says, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, we're waiting for Groucho. We knocked on the door. The woman said, just a minute. We're going to go inside. Groucho doesn't want to see you. She says, what do you think happened? She called downstairs. She said, to get rid of you. <laughs> so the German house stick and the three of us, or the four of us, get into the elevator. We go downstairs. And we go over to the concierge. And uh, we say, oh, can, we, can we leave Groucho a note, like a letter? And the concierge, a very nice guy, says, sure, sure. And we're writing notes. And the German house stick is watching us. says, Groucho's not going to read your letters. <laughs> Groucho's not going to read your letters, you know. So, uh, <laughs> and I, I you know, I, I write him a fan letter and I give my address, you know. Hopefully he could send me an autographed picture or whatever. So uh, the concierge leans in and says, you know, Groucho's leaving tomorrow morning. He has to be at the airport at 11 and uh, he has a wake-up call at such and such a time and he should be passing through this lobby like between 8 and 9 or something like that, you know. I just thought you'd like to know. <laughs> My friend and I would look at each other, okay. So we get on the subway, and we're like thinking, you know, we're in t-shirts, we're in shorts, it's summer. We gotta dress up for tomorrow morning. So I put on my, my, my bar mitzvah suit, <laughs> and he gets dressed up, and we realized we didn't have anything. The autograph hounds gave us an idea, because they had stuff for him to sign, we had nothing. So I had a great eight by 10 uh, of Groucho and Margaret Dumont from Duck Soup, and my friend had an eight by 10 of Chico and Groucho from Night at the Opera. And I took the glass out of the frame of my picture, and I figured this way he could sign it, you know? And then I took my friend's picture and I put it on the back so he could sign one and we could flip it over and he could sign the other. So we get into the lobby and we're sitting there and we're just waiting for Groucho. Um, we also hear that Evil Knievel's there. <laughs> and he's about to do his Snake Canyon jump or something like that. And so uh, he comes out, Evil Knievel, and he's dressed like Evil Knievel. He's ready to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, my friend says, oh, we should get an autograph of Evil Knievel because, you know, he may, he may not make it. You know? <laughs> and I, I didn't use this language, but I could say now, fuck Evil Knievel. <laughs> I'm here for Groucho. I, I was sitting just staring at the elevator bank because I didn't want to miss him. So my friend gets the autograph, whatever. Groucho comes out of the elevator, and he looks like 
he did on the Dick Cavett show. He had the beret, the turtleneck, and he's walking very slowly, and he's staring at me. Now, I don't know if he, he was thinking I was very fat, or <laughs> that kid's too fat, or, or I looked, he had that look like an older person, if you've ever visited anybody at a senior citizen's home. Sometimes old people look at you like they know you, and he's like staring, and I'm like a deer at headlights. I'm just sitting there, I can't even move. And he's walking, and my friend grabs me, come on, let's go, let's go. And my friend is doing all the talking. And he says, uh, Groucho, we're big fans. Uh, uh, we love you. Could, could we get your autograph? And Aaron Fleming is with him. Now, you all know Aaron Fleming, right? And Aaron Fleming says, Groucho has no time to sign your autographs. He's racing to the airport. And this is Groucho at his age racing to the airport. <laughs> well, he sees the picture, you know, of him and Chico that my friend is holding. And he goes, I'll sign him. She gets really mad. She has this clutch bag, a big black bag, probably had a hair dryer from the hotel <laughs> it was stuffed. She throws it over her shoulder onto the floor and she's stomping on it like a kid and she's using language, fuck shit, mother, I mean, she, language I never heard before. I was only 14 years old. It was 1970. I didn't even know they had those words then, you know, and she's going up and she storms over to the concierge and she's complaining, I guess, about us. So Groucho signs the picture and I, I notice he makes that lowercase g, he's pressing it. We had a big pen, you know, and he just signs it. And then I flip it over and he sees himself and Margaret Dumont, and he goes, oh, and, if, and he seemed to be amused by the flipping over of it, you know, and he's amused by it, and, and, he, and he looks at it kind of a long way, and then he, he signs it, it's very deliberate. This little boy came over, and he had just a blank piece of paper, and he said, I don't sign blank pieces of paper, which was kind of odd. <laughs> but he didn't cite it. And then he proceeds out. Now, my friend had a brand new Polaroid camera, a uh, white plastic thing or whatever. He runs ahead outside. I run out with him, and Groucho's outside, and my friend sets himself up to take a picture of Groucho, and Groucho freezes. <laughs> and my friend's holding the camera. He says, what's wrong? He's, he's not moving. And I said, he's holding for a still. <laughs> and so my friend clicks it. The thing spits out, and Groucho continues. You know? <laughs> he gets into the limo, and he's with Charlotte... Chandler, is that her name? She wrote, Hello, I Must Be Going. I recognized her by her red wig. She was sitting in there. I'd seen her on the Joe Franklin show. And he gets into the car, and so my friend is trying to get the Paula right, and we're looking at the picture and everything. And uh, we decide we're going to thank him. Now, he's behind glass. So we're saying, thank you, Groucho, thank you. And he smiles, and he realizes there's glass between us, so maybe we can't hear him. And he goes, goodbye. He's emphasizing. And I could still see his eyes and his teeth right now as I tell you this. Goodbye. I, I could hear the goodbye. I don't know. But he, but he was emphasizing that, so we see it, and we wave to him and everything. So I'm going to show you right now the picture I got in the moment. Let's see if I have this right. Well, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Hold on. It'll be hard for you to see the autograph. It was a big pen, and it was 50 years ago. But uh, I could show it to you a little closer later. But this is the picture that he signed. It's pro you probably can't see it, but it's right here. The autograph. This is the one he signed. My friend's picture was on the back, and we flipped it over. So about a month later, the house stick was a little wrong about Gracias not going to read the letters. I get in the mail a large envelope, return address, Groucho, Hollywood, California. And this was in there. And this is a, a Sharpie, so you can see it. Now, it's very funny. I was Robert William Greenberg at that point. And he signs Bob, right? It says Bob, Bob best wishes, Groucho. So I bring this to, to college. I'm in film school. Four, this is four years later. And my friend Gene Peron sees this. He says, well, if Groucho called you Bob, we should call you Bob, too. He did. <laughs> so years go by, and Steve Stolier writes the book uh, Raised Eyebrows, and he was Groucho's corresponding secretary at the time. And when Groucho received any mail or anything, uh, it was Steve who would read him the letters, or at least summarize the letters. And it was Steve who would personalize the pictures. So, so this Bob is actually Steve Stoller's. Groucho didn't name me. <laughs> Unless Groucho said, call him Bob, I don't know. But, <laughs> but there it is. And then the other thing, the other thing that Stoller said, that Groucho would get a little lazy with his lowercase g, and it would look more like a Y sometimes. And I noticed, because I was there in person, he did have a little difficulty doing this on the top of the G. So Stolia would add a little line. And it was years and years later that I realized that 
the Sharpie in the <laughs> Bob Best Wishes is a slightly thinner line than the Groucho, and he added a little line on the top of the, the Groucho. But it's still beautiful, isn't it? It's still beautiful. And the, and the one, this one that I got in person is, is an incredible memory. So uh, thank you, Steve Stoyer, for calling me Bob. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm Bob Greenberg. Thank you. Yeah.